Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. So glad you could join me. Yeah, spring is here, even here. <laughs> Dropping around out there in the mud, uh, but still good to be out in the sunshine. I don't care what's on the ground, as long as it ain't white. How about yourself? How's your spring going so far? Are you doing all the things you'd resolved to do in January? Well, good for you. We got one of the things that may be uh, of interest to you here, you know, getting so many requests for advice on gun shy dogs. In fact, uh, uh, so much so that uh, I, I basically dug deep and found some experts in that area. John and hopefully Jessica Hahn from Perfection Kennels will be joining us for the bulk of the Upland Nation podcast talking about gun shy, how to prevent it how to train around it, if you will, and then everything else that has to do with dog training. These folks know their stuff, and they'll be cluing us in to all the things that are important to you and me, especially this time of year. We'll also, um, uh, well, let's see, what are we going to talk about? Finding some new places, how to find new places to hunt. That'll be the subject of our road trip feature this week. And then we'll talk about whether or not you have already started planning. Yeah, your responses to the Upland Nation Index poll will be available coming up in just a moment or two. It's all made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, Trulock Choke Tubes, MidwayUSA.com, Joy Dog Food, and find birdhuntingspots.com. Well, I'm working hard on the one thing that uh, Flick and I both need to focus on, and that is steadiness. I've been talking about it for a while. I, I will belabor the point one more time, then hopefully uh, I won't bore you anymore with it. But we're down to the wire on uh, on pigeons, at least, putting multiple pigeons on the ground right in front of him. Hopefully he's going to stand still, watch those birds fly away, even with a cap gun or uh, blank pistol popping off, um, not right in front of him. That's not a good idea, but near enough to get the idea. We're in the field now, just at random, putting those birds down on the ground where he can swing around, see them. No, we're not worrying about scenting. It's all about sight pointing and staying steady, and it seems to be working so far. Knock wood. You, uh, well, a goodly number of you are already um, putting your wish list together or getting even farther along for that, which is the reason we're going to talk more about it during our road trip segment. But in the meanwhile, 41% of you have already laid plans for the big trip of this hunting season. Wow. I know a lot of us are, are thinking about that on the drive home from the last hunt from uh, last season, but uh, I'm a little surprised, frankly. Here we are in you know, still in April, and uh, you've already got it figured out. I am looking at several. Can't wait to get back together with everybody, so I'll keep you posted on uh, on that as it uh, coalesces. In the meanwhile, uh, the 59% of you who haven't, uh, I'll have some advice for you coming up later in the podcast, which is brought to you by Joy Dog Food, family-owned and operated, 100% American-made food with American ingredients. I like their high-quality products and high-performance formulations. You will, too. Take a look at them. Put some joy in your dog's life. Visit joydogfood.com. And uh, I know, I know, I just got another box full of stuff from midwayusa.com. They do have just about everything. That's why I keep going back there. Got some more Target ammo. Got a nice uh, uh, fleece sweatshirt uh, to uh, put underneath something else. I'll wear it in one of the videos, so watch for that down the road. But congratulations, everyone at Midway USA. You've just earned the 2022 BizRate Platinum Circle of Excellence Award. Now, to them, that's one thing. To us, it's another thing. The award is based on customer feedback recognizes retailers who go above and beyond to provide exceptional online service. Yeah, 
Try them and see for yourself. MidwayUSA.com. So glad to have them aboard because so many people have sent me notes or called me or texted me and asked about gun shyness. I have my own gun shy stories to talk about. Knockwood, none of my dogs, but that's a story for another day. John and Jessica Hahn of Perfection Kennels in Gallatin, Missouri, uh, join me on the other end of the line. John, Jessica, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Uh, thanks for inviting us. We appreciate you having us on. It's a subject that's near and dear to our hearts. You um, you actually came rec- highly recommended, and so I'm glad we could finally do it. I know we've had a few hiccups trying to get our calendars together, and even now I appreciate you're taking a little time out of, um, to, to many folks, what is a real busy time of year. Tell me where you are and what you're doing right now. Uh, right now we're in Raymond, Nebraska. We're at the AKC All-Breed National Championship. Um, and uh, just completed uh, four days of running off horseback and uh, get a little break. And so we got time to talk to you today. Yeah, and then you go right back at it with a walking trial, right? Yeah, we do. So we're, uh, uh, I'm getting old, but I find it uh, inspiring to try to keep walking with these young people out here. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Jessica, you uh, you probably feel right at home uh, during those horseback trials because you've got a background in that world, don't you? I sure do. I used to train reining horses for a living, and I really enjoy riding the horses and scouting. And I like the walking trials as well. You know, John and I spend a lot of our spare time hunting our own dogs. And so we love to hunt on foot and then take our dogs out and do walking trials. So it's the best of both worlds. We get to have horses in our life and dogs in our life. And, and just for those who aren't as familiar with that, um, we all know what a horse is. We all know that there are field trials and you're, you're chasing after the dogs on horses. But a lot of folks don't realize there's a high level of com- competition, if you will, in the walking stakes as well. What, what, what kind of distances are you covering in a walking trial? Um, I don't know. Uh, this will be an hour stake, and it'll be probably about uh, three miles an hour. Uh, with bird work and stuff and uh, it's uh it's a pretty good pace and the dogs the same dogs that we run and the and the walking will be the same dogs we just competed with in the horseback state wow so they're they're covering a lot of ground we hope they do <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, yeah i i gotta put my head back into the trial scene to remember that that is one of the what else what else are judges looking for besides run in in either of these well, it's a little bit of a misconception um, is that, you know, it's about bird dogs. And if you have a great bird dog that, and it's about application to cover, going to the right kind of places to find birds, and then their manners around birds, it's not just run. They just have to be fast and cover a lot of ground in the right places. A lot of dogs will run down the middle of the field, which doesn't count. But if you have a dog on the edges and the cover, that's what they're looking for. So, um so would, would it be of, of benefit, whether it's a walk-in trial, and I can hear those guys in the background, they're ready to go again right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, what, it, I, I've always recommended that even if you're not going to run a dog in one, to go to a few trials and see how it's done. It, it, would you agree? I, I absolutely agree. I think it's a wonderful thing to do with your dog. And for those of us that love to hunt, it gives you an extension of your season. You can go play other games with your dog, and the walking trials are quite popular. You do not have to have a horse. And John and I are always huge advocates of wild bird hunting because if you do that with your dog, you can be successful in any venue, hunt tests, field trials. And so it's a wonderful option for people who do hunt to be able to go and attend these field trials and compete with their dog, and it extends their season a bit. Oh, I can't agree more. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I'm glad you're doing well there. Congratulations. You've already gotten a placement or two, I heard. Yes, we did get a placement. We had a Vizsla, the interesting story. He had histoplasmosis uh, last year, and he just get, got cleared a few months ago, and we put him, got him back in shape, and he just got a placement at this national event, and we're proud of that for him. And his well, owners. happy ending there. Um how uh you know how how does a dog recover from something like that to the point where he can actually score 
well in a horseback trial? And what do you do to rehab a dog like that? So um, he's been on antifungals for quite some time. And he, unfortunately, he did lose a testicle to the disease, but he's been recovering slowly. And about 60 days ago, we slowly put him back to work starting 10 minutes a day. Yeah. And then we tested him out at a couple of trials to see if he could handle the stress. And we just kept adding a little bit more, a little bit more. And it, if at any point he seemed stressed, we backed off a little. And he's done extremely well. Okay, everybody, you can uncross your legs now after that. <laughs> <laughs> um wow that's incredible so pretty incredible yeah, yeah. what a, what a great piece of news and I'm, I'm glad for you and a visla no no less i mean how many vizlas are running those trials two <laughs> uh, there was actually i i think six or seven in this trial wow mm-hmm. and how about your personal dogs when you're when you are hunting for fun what what kind of dogs are you two running we have German shorthair pointers. Yeah. We have the greatest dogs in the world. Oh, second greatest. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Although mine was re- mine was mistaken for a short hair not an hour ago. And I, <laughs> of course, uh, uh, so those people will will never be invited back. <laughs> 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 um, so so let's get down to the to the meat of the matter before uh, we go into anything else and we will cover a whole bunch of ground but the first one is the most important one to me i had to rescue a german wire hair who had been introduced to uh to gunfire by um uh pointing a preserve pheasant and having four people unload their semi-automatic guns on that bird still missed and that dog was behind and underneath the truck as quickly as as any dog i've ever heard about Um, that's the wrong way to do it Um, let's talk about what you see and what you do so if we're at that point uh, we can do it the right way from the very beginning Uh, first of all it's trying to educate people to have an understanding of uh, what is uh, going through the dog's mind and the presentation to the gun and, and how they, and the, the, the typical ways to introduce this is, is testing of tolerance. Basically, you introduce gunfire and hope they, they're okay with it, and whether they're pulling a bird or eating or whatever. And a lot of dogs at some point, they run out of tolerance for the gunfire. And the basis, basic difference in what we do is that we acclimate the dogs to the gun based off a conditioned response to, to teach them to love the gun. And, and, and basically the technique that we use, which we call a gun acclimation, is a um, the way that I devised fixing gun-shy dogs. So now that every dog we, we, we introduce to the, to the uh, gun is brought through this process. How, how do you start? I mean, you know, everybody's got their own version of it. And, the, you know, the worst case is, oh, I just take my puppy and I start in the parking lot and I walk up to the line at a, at a, at a trap club. Um, the opposite is, well, we're banging on pans when they eat and then, you know, they chase birds and we pop off a blank gun. How, what about you? Where, where does your routine begin? Well, it, it's based off, and I didn't even know this when I created it, um, this technique and found it. I basically found it because I made a dog, dog gun shy. Yeah. And I sat down and thought about it and looked at the situation and thinking about how what, what we're doing normally is we're presenting something to the dog and then while they're engaging in that something, a bird or whatever it is, we shoot a gun hoping they tolerate it. Mm-hmm. So all I did was reverse it and brought the gunfire at a, at a, you know, a long ways away or, or a low sound volume and made and every time the gun went off I, I introduced something fun yeah so the gun would go off first and something fun would happen it could be a treat or it could be a bird flying off or a bird to retrieve or whatever and years later i i read a book for the first time in my life and i found pavlov <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he does. He's not much for writing, but he had some pretty good ideas. Exactly. Uh, so, well, yeah. and, and so the basis of it is, is that we're we're building a conditional response at the very beginning okay. with a dog with gunfire, and even dogs that can be maybe even naturally be gun sensitive or noise sensitive learn to love the sound of the gun because something happy and fun happens every time they hear gunfire. So it's the opposite. It's gunfire first, then something fun happens. Okay, so so let me stop you right there because that is kind of a revelation for me. Um, it the gun the gun is the first 
the first part and then the positive whatever comes after the gun. That, yes. Correct. Yes. Uh, now, I understand with Pavlov how that works if we want him to drool and we want him to eat or press a bell or whatever. But so you got to start way back in the distance with a light gauge or even a you know starter pistol or a cap gun. Is that part of it as well, the distance and the volume? I know you mentioned that. It, it is. And we use a starter pistol, a blank pistol, 209 primer. And we started at about 120 to 150 yards with that. Yeah. If it's a dog that we start and not, not a problem dog. And then we work our way closer through four or five sessions. Yeah. And yeah. doing 10 to 12 shots per session. And then once they've graduated from the blank gun, we, we back up to that same distance again, whether it be 120 or 150 yards. And then we start again with a 20 gauge shotgun doing yeah. the same procedure over yeah. and over. Wow. Okay. I, I just, just for everybody's benefit, I want, I want to reiterate, you're over a hundred yards away when you introduce these shots. That is, I'm so glad to hear that because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm right there with you on that stuff. Good you know what, what we find so many people say, well, I shot around them, but it wasn't very close. And we'll say, well, how close did you shoot? And yeah. they'll say, Oh, 30 to 40 yards. Yeah. And, and we cringe and go, that's way too close. So yeah. remember when you're introducing this to dogs, they have to they have to understand it. And if it's too loud or too overbearing the first time they hear it, it frightens them. And it's a muscle memory, uh, I'm sorry, memory for them that can stick out in their brain and be very frightening to them. And so we start slowly, we back way up and make sure that they are giving us an actual response. And we find that after three shots, the dog understands what's going to happen and they start to look towards the gun for the drop of the bird whether it be a frozen bird or a pigeon that we throw and besides the birds um uh, somebody mentioned treats um what other things work for somebody at home who is looking for all those other i, I guess i'll call them positive reinforcers uh besides those uh it's basically just anything that the dog might love. So yeah. let's say that you have a dog that loves tennis balls. Yeah. And and he goes crazy over tennis balls. Well, if the only time he sees a tennis ball for the next two weeks is when he hears that gunfire. Yes. Um, so so basically the timing of this is is that when you walk out into the field and you have your uh, friend or neighbor stand 100 yards down the field and, and they shoot a gun, that dog is instinctively just going to look to go, what's that? And if that ball or the bird or whatever is thrown towards that gun, you know, say 20 yards, and at the, the first three shots, by, like Jessica said, by the fourth shot, they're going to look expecting to see that ball fall or the bird fall. Yeah. So you got to know your dog and you got to know what your dog loves. Probably mm -hmm. can't go wrong with a bird, frozen, dead, or otherwise, but the, there are other things and they're all worthwhile. Exactly. And it's just about conditioning the dog's get a response from the gunfire and it's really interesting and, and again like I'll, i said is that this was developed in a way to fix gun shy dogs yeah and after finding this method i just one day said well let's just do all the dogs we start this way and we have never had a gun shy dog come through this process well they you know, all are 100 percent you love the guy it, it makes all the sense in the world but nobody ever thinks about it quite that way so I'm, I'm glad to hear it presented so clearly by the way you're listening to the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden that's john and jessica han of uh, uh perfection kennels and we are talking gun shy among other things we're going to cover a lot of training and some other problem solving as we get deeper into this uh but on the gun on the gun shy thing when you when somebody brings a dog in hoping that you can help what have they probably done or are there you know is there a, a you know is there a uh, a rogues gallery of of bad behavior that these people have brought to you? Well, I think that the most common problem we have is when people have a gun-shy dog, number one, they don't recognize the subtle signs that lead up to being gun-shy. They can be very slight, such as the ear slicked back, the head dropped down, the dog not following the bird as it flies. Um, and then it can go to the extreme of running back to the truck or hiding under the truck. Um, they won't leave your side. They won't hunt. Sometimes they'll hunt too far away from you, but they never find a bird close to you. They start blinking birds. 
So there's a vast array of things that show up when your dog is gun shy. But I think the biggest problem people have is they try to fix gun shy by repeating the same thing they've done to make them gun shy. Yeah. And it makes the problem continually worse. So um, sounds like the first thing they ought to do if they, they see any of those uh, evidences is to stop shooting. Correct. And then what? Bring them to you, of course. But if we're not near well, Gall- Gallatin, Missouri, what are we going to do? If, if first of all, we do we help a lot of people um, through the technology that we have now that people will send us videos of their dogs and stuff and we'll evaluate that way. And then a lot of people use a video we sell, the gunshot fix. Yeah. And uh, interestingly enough, we sell a video that's called the, the perfect gun acclimation, and then we have a separate one called the gunshot fix. The sad part is we sell about five times more of the gun shy fix than we do the, the perfect gun acclimation, uh, yeah. which means people aren't getting the 911 until they have a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but the basis of it is if your dog's not, you know, it's real, we don't even have to shoot around the dog with a bird to evaluate. We don't need to even see gunfire around the dog. We just need to watch the dog around the bird. Huh. Because what happens with dogs, they're associative learners. And if they've, if they've, had a, a bad experience with a gun around a bird, what do they blame it on? It's always blamed on the bird. And so they avoid looking at birds. The bird, They may be engaged in it while it's on the ground, but as soon as that bird gets up to it's really interesting. It gives me goosebumps because their social learning skills are so deep that they may be interested in the bird that's about 10 foot high and 20 yards out. Wow. And that's the place where most birds are shot. And that's where they'll turn around or quit looking at the bird, they'll look away from it. They'll actually veer off left or right and quit following the bird. And those are the, the, the signs of a gunshot dog without even having to shoot a rabbit. Wow. I would imagine that ultimately that that leads to a dog that won't retrieve either. It sure does many yeah. times. Yeah. So a retrieving it, problem side, might be that. <laughs> Go ahead, Jessica. We oftentimes, we oftentimes get dogs in that they send to us for force training and we find that they're gun shy, and once we fix the gun shy problem, they start retrieving. Yeah, yeah. So oh, that that is a common theme. It is all related in one or more ways, and uh, fascinating to me. So, um, uh, give me a worst case scenario. What is the worst story you've ever heard? Somebody brings a dog to you, or they're just they know your expertise, so they've got to share a horror story with you. What is the worst one you've heard? Well, we we have actually fixed thousands, but and the worst cases are the ones where um, there's two things that the boys the bird dogs will completely avoid the scent of a bird. Oh wow! Meaning that they don't even indicate it's there. They go away from it. They may smell the bird and go home, or go back to the car, or come back to the owner. And the second thing is, is also going to be a visual association based off someone carrying a gun. Oh wow! Meaning meaning that they've in situations where people go out and they take the shot and they put the dog on his first bird. This is, happens quite often. You know, everybody gets excited and they go out and put them on a bird and the bird flies and they shoot it and it's all over because the, and it, that's probably the worst cases because the first bird the dog has ever seen carries that mark of being full of fear. And it's basically a form of PTSD based off the bird. Yeah. You and know, that's probably the worst. It makes all the sense in the world when you lay it out so clearly. It's uh, We just don't think like that. And most people, just like we all think we're such great shooters, we all think our dogs are born born to handle all this stuff. Um, just for the record, one more time. When when you're bringing it when you're bringing a dog along, whether um, you're doing it via your um, DVDs or you got a client who's brought a dog to you and, and you're doing it from 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 scratch, fresh dog, no problems. How long does the process take? Well, we we do clinics where people come to us and they'll spend four days with us, mm-hmm. and we do what's called a puppy start. And those are puppies that have never been introduced to a bird or an e collar. Yeah, and typically at the halfway mark of day three, we're shooting birds over that puppy. Wow. And so that's eight to 10 sessions of gun acclimation per dog. Okay. And the, the sessions run maybe 15 to 20 minutes. All right. So if, if you know, if, if we do everything right and follow your plan, in a matter of a few weeks, a dog can be worked through all that. Easily, quite Great. easily. You could, if you, if you only had weekends, but you had a good helper mm-hmm. that can shoot for you, 
Mm-hmm. And and just shoot the blank gun when you raise your hand. It's quite simple. Yeah. Uh, you can have your dog completely gun acclimated in two days. Wow. All mm-hmm. right. Uh, but never hurts to take your time, everybody. <laughs> so let's <laughs> let's not rush things there. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, just along the same lines, we're not rushing things here at the Upland Nation podcast. John and Jessica will be back from Perfection Kennels in just a moment or two. So uh, stick around. Uh, we are brought to you in part by Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School. Yeah, they're your Browning shotgun source. Call Dave Fiedler to find those classic shotguns, whether it's historic product lines like the Satori or uh, some of the newer guns that uh, may be a little bit harder to find. Dave's got a line on everybody down there at the Browning headquarters. So if you're not finding what you're looking for, check out midvalleyclays.com and have Dave or somebody over there search for the right Browning gun for you. And um, speaking of shooting, truelockchokes.com. They make their choke tubes primarily from 17-4 stainless steel bar stock. Now, they may not (laughs) mean a lot to you and me, but to the guys at Truelock, it means a heck of a lot because that's the most rust-resistant and corrosion-resistant steel you can find. Then they're heat-treated. Anyway, you get the idea. These guys put a lot. They're choke tube geeks. And we benefit. And I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, a great choke tube will fix your pattern, and a fixed pattern will kill more birds for you next season. They're all made in the United States of U.S. steel, so um, everything in there is uh, worthy of a salute. Take a look at truelockchokes.com. And from a field trial somewhere in Nebraska, where I'd love to be right about, well, I think I'll wait till fall till I get out there again. But <laughs> you folks, you, you've got the dogs all put up. John and Jessica Han from Perfection Kennels uh, doing a great job out there already. So tell me, what do you do for a day and a half in between the horseback trials and the walking trials? You got to you got to sleep in a little bit, maybe, and then go from there? <laughs> well, no, there's no sleeping in in this business. I so believe it. <laughs> it's, uh, we have a couple of uh, young pups that we have a little extra time. We've been, we, we're going out to places where on um, WMAs in Nebraska until April 30th, and you can take your dogs out and, and let them find wild birds. So, um, when we're not training dogs, we're taking young pups out and letting them uh, learn to be bird dogs. Yeah. And which is uh, the development of them. And then we have a few dogs that will be exercising and uh, doing some adjustments from the last run that we need to make on them before they run the next time. And it's constantly something to do. But the, the fun part is taking puppies out and finding wild birds. That's what we're doing first thing in the morning. Love it. And, um, and what uh, are the, they're per- your personal dogs. So they're short hairs. Yeah, there are two pups of ours that are out of our lines that uh, are up and coming, our bird hunting buddies, and uh, they'll be uh, running the trials here soon. So what, what do you expect from a young dog, and how young are they, and then what do you expect when you put them out on the ground and maybe in a place where there might be wild birds? What What's the criteria for you? Well, the interesting thing is, is that a lot of people – this time of year is a fantastic time of year to start developing young dogs, even just to hunt for next year. Mm-hmm. Um, when these dogs were, they're about six months old, but they were 12, 14 weeks old. They had already started pointing their own wild cubbies in Missouri. Yeah. Um, Cause they'd been on the ground enough with our older dogs that they knew what they were looking for. And it's so it, it, a little advanced for everybody is get your dogs out this time of year on the wild birds and let them learn how to handle them. They'll already have that under their belt before you take them, when you drop that tailgate in the fall, they'll know what they're doing. You do that and then get them kind of acclimated. You got a bird dog. So we always talk about uh, dog, uh, young dog learning how to handle wild birds, but um, Jessica, define that for us. What do you expect from a wild bird dog their first season? You know, the first season is about developing and allowing them to figure out how to use their nose, how to pattern. Um, how to go to the right places to find birds. And 
we really believe that one of the most important things is putting your pup down in a lot of different types of terrain. Mm -hmm. um, for example, our little puppies have now hunted New Mexico, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, Missouri, and Iowa. Wow. And so at this age, they're only five and six months old right now. And they've found birds in every one of those locations. And that's how you develop a great bird dog. And, and, and as they're very little, of course, you want to put them down with a dog that might help them learn how to go to the right places. But once they figure that out, it's time for them to go and find their own birds. And it's very, very successful. If you just put on your shoes and, and uh, spend a lot of shoe leather out there with your pups, you're going to find birds. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to interject a little bit here. Yeah. Um, something I think that you're asking maybe that we're not getting to is that a lot of things that's misunderstood today with, with bird dog training is, is a, well, there's so many much pen raised bird work. We do it too. A lot of pen raised bird work, but the dog's genetics are based off wild birds. And so when you introduce them and they have to interact with them, wild birds, they're, they're pointing a stick bubbles to the top. I mean, they learn they can't get close. They can't, they can't approach the birds. They can't catch the birds. And so the more interaction they have with wild birds, the better point you're going to get out of your dog and the longer they're going to stand there. Yeah, got it. And I'm looking at a covey of valley quail as we speak. So oh, we'll, we'll, oh, we'll, boy. we'll be out there in a few minutes. But uh, no, don't worry. I won't cut you all short. No, no. <laughs> don't, don't panic, everybody. Um, but so so the the challenge becomes most people – don't have what we're lucky enough to have. And I'm, again, I touch wood every time I say this, but if we have to deal with pen raised, pen raised game birds or even pigeons, and we do, is there anything we can do to, to create a more wild experience for a young dog? There, there certainly is. And one of the things that we really advocate with these young puppies that are not broke yet, um, and, and let me just preface this with saying that the pen raised birds can be the demise of a great bird dog if you allow them from a young age to creep up on those birds and catch them. Yeah. Because understanding that the instinct to point is based on the game getting away. And if the game doesn't get away, they have no reason to point. And so what we tell our clients is that you have to think of a wild bird as a fly that lands on your leg. And anytime you go to swat a fly, you pause above it because you know it's going to fly away. <laughs> well, that's a wild bird. So if you think about a pen raised bird, think about that pen raised bird being a ladybug that lands on your leg and you just swat it away. You don't have to pause because it's not going to fly away. And so when you put your puppy on pen raised birds and allow them to catch, it directly takes away the instinct to point. And so what we tell our clients, if you don't have access to wild birds, get yourself some good bird launchers and pigeons, not quail, because the quail might just hit the ground and not fly. Yeah. Um, put, and put those pigeon launchers in areas where you think you would find a wild bird and take your puppies out on those launchers. And, and anytime you think they even catch scent of that launcher whatsoever, you pop it. Yeah. Oh, and I'm doing it right. Yahoo! <laughs> <laughs> Good uh, job. Yeah. yeah. So, so keep, give me a liver treat and we're, we'll move on. But that, <laughs> uh, I mean, that is, that is, that is just fan, fantastic information and, useful to everybody and you know th th that means you need the remote control launchers and i know they're not cheap i'm very lucky mm -hmm. i have several but but I in the long run that is the way to simulate a wild bird at least as close as you can get isn't it correct that's exactly right and and i would challenge people there's so many wonderful bird dog people out there that build a build a community within the yeah. people that you work with and help each other use each other's equipment get pigeons somebody will have a coop and and outsource a little bit try to get to know people and you can be very successful absolutely uh so so overall uh, what is the perfection kennel kind of training philosophy and how do you manifest that with a young dog well, it's based off instinct. It's based off their of their their ability to hunt, as far as their instincts are, um, based off their parentage. But it's developing that point, developing the retrieve. It's using a lot of finesse and not a lot. I mean, we, the puppy's development, and again, we call it shoe leather. If you and we tell people this all the time, if you get a dog that you have trained to hear or respond to recall properly, you teach them the gun acclimation, and then you go walk. 
you take your dogs and put them on wild birds. And, and I know that's difficult for a lot of people. And we say this to people all the time that we'll call them, you know, and, they, and it just depends on what your priorities are. But um, we're in Nebraska right now that anybody with in the, uh, could drive here could literally come out to these WNAs until the end of this month and be finding wild birds. Um, so that's available. And it's going to enhance your dog's ability as a great bird dog twofold compared to if you just wait till the, the season starts um but the philosophy is that and then also the, the 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 training that we do with the collar and stuff is a lot of finesse training it's it's basically um that's how i you know started my career with videos and doing clinics and seminars was teaching people to properly use the collar electronic collar and not use it as abusive tool but as a tool of teaching and and trying to get people to understand behaviors from the dogs based off their instincts and putting those all together um we train some of the hardest headed very hard-headed dogs and some very soft timid dogs and we get the same results because we bend our techniques from one dog to the next and we also we do these trials and stuff we do this uh competitive thing because you know as a trainer we want to show that we can and we can compete out here and, mm-hmm. and create dogs that are completely trained broke. We hunt our dogs completely broke once they're finished. Um, I mean, stay when we shot and fall. And there's a lot of controversy about that. But the point is, being having the ability to do that is through finesse and behavior training more than just a lot of force and, and uh, abuse, I guess you'd say. Yeah, and I want to talk about all three of those. We'll go from from the back to the front. You you mentioned uh, controversy over a, a, what I'll call a fully broke dog, steady to wing shot and fall. What? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who could argue that? <laughs> well, and, and, you know, a lot of people that – I'll just answer that real quick – that you talk to that are hunters – um, they're always saying that they want their dogs to be right on that bird when it hits the ground. Yeah, yeah. And my answer is that we all need to just learn to shoot better. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, so, but th- there are pros and cons to it, but a classy bird dog, you know, when you're classy like we all are. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> with, yeah. That's a, with a capital K, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but it's about the dog our hunting and our shoe leather and the miles we put on every year um just of our personal dog is about the dog and you know i am probably like you i grew up bird hunting i've shot boatloads of birds but i don't care anymore i like the dog work and i think everybody has to go through that process and hunting but having that whole thing where your dog runs out there in the prairie and north dakota and points to start to grouse and two or three hundred yards and waits for you to get there you walk up you shoot a double and your dog stands there you're releasing the retrieve and they go get one then we get the other one what else is there I mean, that's that's it i can't and argue so that at all no right <laughs> so but some people just want the dog to be on the bird right away so you know i just tell people um a very well-trained dog is going to save game and it's going to help you get more game meaning yep. that if those quail that you looked at your window at the ruggo if you want to throw your dog, your dog pointed them, and and when you flush, if that dog takes off after those birds, right when you first flush the first ones, the whole covey scatters. Yeah, and and, and th- there's the practical application. The other one is, as I told you, and one of the reasons we're talking now instead of six weeks ago is, um, when a dog is not study, he 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 tends to run into barbed wire fences once in a while exactly. and um that, it, yeah flick's doing fine everybody you can't even yeah. hardly tell he's got any scars but uh but that's another one and and that safety thing uh even more so for example in chakra country where i hunt if your dog breaks on the covey rise um there's a 10 percent chance that covey is going over a cliff and your dog's going with it very good mm-hmm. point mm-hmm so there are plenty of reasons for it, and I understand those. We won't belabor those, but that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. The other is the e-collar and how you use it, because I, I, I think you're alluding to some different ways to use it than many people do. Well, the beautiful thing about the e-collar is that if you have good timing as your dog's trainer, the dog has the ability to turn the stimulation off by giving the right response, the way that we train. Yeah. And so we use the lowest level possible to to get the correct response from the dog. We we do not use the e-collar to punish the dog in any way. 
And so we teach through it, starting off with a check cord through the whole process, for example, teaching here. And we're going to hold the stimulation on until the dog is looking at you and coming towards you, and then we're going to release it. And if we're consistent with that, the dog learns the proper answer on the lowest possible level. And so for each dog, that's different. And and oftentimes people get nervous about the e-collar, and they, they feel as though it's, um, it's too harsh for a dog. But you have to understand that each dog's tolerance for electricity is different, just as people's is. And so if you take a dog and say, our dog Huck is on a seven on everything, but we have another young puppy that's on a one or a two right now with here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that doesn't have anything to do with her age. It has to do with her tolerance to electricity. Yeah. And so um, you have to find the appropriate level for the dog. And that's what we're experts at. We really take our time with the e-collar and teach the dog. We don't. We want to make sure they understand everything before we put them in a situation where we're going to have to go up too high on the collar or a situation they're not prepared for. Well, let, let me just get this clear because this is a, this is a, a, a kind of new for a lot of people. And that is, so when you've got a dog and they, let's, they're comfortable with a collar, they're on a check cord and you're teaching them to come to you. Um, mm-hmm. So we're going to overlay collar and check cord this time around. So before we give a command, are we pressing the button and then bringing the dog towards us? This is a real important point. Okay, so we have to associate the word with the stimulation. So yeah. it has to be paired exactly at the same time. Yeah. At the same time the dog hears it, not whenever we say it. I mean, and it, and we'll say that in, in further down the line, the dog may be at 100 yards. And you've got this training done. You want to apply this training. You, you have to delay this, the stimulation just a tad before you, uh, after you say the word. But yes, when you're teaching it, and the basis of it is, like, this is something that we teach a lot. And it's our concept for people to understand. And it's a saying: when the eyes go, the feet follow. That's yeah. all you got to remember. Yeah. If you if you go out in your yard right now and you tell your dog, "What's your recall word is here or come," it doesn't matter. But if you say that recall word and they don't look directly at you stay focused on you and come directly to you they're not correctly here or recall trained and and the key to the training that we do is teaching that that response on low stimulations that the time when timing of when the stimulation is turned off with the pairing of the check cord to help guide the eyes you're guiding the eyes towards you um at that moment that you turn off that stimulation right when they're focused on your your legs your torso your your whatever they're looking right at you they learn to look at you when they feel that stimulation paired with that word. And if you can maintain that timing, it's amazing how fast dogs will learn to look right at you and focus on you all the way back. And, and it's just that little saying where the eyes go, the feet follow. Yeah. I'm going to work on that myself. <laughs> that's, it works. that's fascinating. And, and, you know, I've, I've written in and, and done some things, that are related in a way in that uh, the dogs think in a linear manner. And, uh, and so when they're moving, they're always going to move in, in the line unless something distracts them. So we're on the same page in that, and I'm fascinated by it. The other thing that I noticed in your, uh, your clinics and seminars, um, one of the things you want us to bring is a, um, is a, well, a slip collar of one sort or another. Am I, am I missing something there, or how do you use that in this training? Uh, it- it depends on the dog. Some dogs yeah. don't need it at all. But w- what happens is we have, typically, if we have a 95-pound lady shows up with a dog, the dog will weigh 120 pounds. <laughs> and, and, and we're trying to teach the dog to have respect and learn to respond to this person because they get dragged around and get hurt. And, you know, and I'm, I, I don't mind pinch collars, the metal ones, just because if it's safety for the person to teach that dog to respond or heal or whatever it is to start with, because there's a lot of strong dogs out there with, with, um, smaller owners that, uh, they need that to help get that point across yeah. at first. Yeah. And that's all it's for is because, um, you know, there's just a lot, they, and, and that pulling thing becomes a habit because people don't know what to do with it and it helps the, the owner gain control. I mean, I'm, you know, Jessica's, you know, five, seven and 140 pounds and I'm six, seven and weigh 280. So we're going from one dog to the next. I mean, and, and that's more about that because it gives the, the more it. leverage to a smaller person. Got it. 
Um, what do you uh, what do you see us do in the field um, that we should probably avoid doing when we're hunting uh, when it comes to a dog? Are there certain bad habits that most of us have? <laughs> Do you have time for a two hour <laughs> We'll be back. <laughs> give us your, give us some of your, your top four. <laughs> so two right off the top of my head would be what we call the sundial. Yeah. And that's where people tend to become like a sundial with their dog and just follow the dog wherever it goes instead of picking a path and going there and having your dog stay in front of you. Remember when you're hunting, you want to find birds in front of you. And so pick your path and have your dog follow in front of you. Well, okay. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Carry on. Oh, well, so uh, I just had that happen. Um, we were in the trees, so I'm, I'm going to cut them some slack. But do you have a do you have a way for us to help our dogs always come to the front? Absolutely. And believe it or not, we start teaching this at eight weeks old with our yeah, puppies. And, yeah. And we can take our two young puppies out right now and run two hours and they don't go behind us. They stay in front of us because we pattern them to stay in front from the very first time we put them on the ground. And so if you have an itty bitty puppy, you're going to stop and wait when it starts to explore. And and that can be excruciating when they're eight, nine weeks old, uh, but you just have to wait. And then when they go forward, you go forward, but don't let them suck behind you. Um, and as they become more advanced, then you can use the collar. If you've taught your dog to, to properly recall with a collar you can use that collar to turn them. And yeah. so each time they get behind you, make sure that you stop. Don't keep walking if your dog is sucking behind you. Ah. Stop, turn the dog, allow them to go forward and then walk again. And pretty soon they'll learn to stay right in front of you. Love it. That's great. And thank you. How about the, mm -hmm. that's number one. So you were ready to give us number two and I interrupted you. And, and number two is <laughs> probably one of the most difficult things for people to do. When they come to clinics, we teach people a proper hear with their dog, and it works so effectively that when people are out in the field with their dog, they start to revert to that to try and get their dog to come closer to them or to turn. And so what we find people doing is instead of saying their dog's name or a whistle to turn them, they tell them hear because it works so effectively, but then they continue to walk, and they lose the value of their recall, which also inadvertently keeps your dog from retrieving properly. Yeah, I see that all the time, and I, mm -hmm. I, I like to think I don't do it. I've got a different command for that. And, <laughs> so, so, John, th those are some of the top ones. How about you? What do you cringe at the most? Uh, well, the, the hair thing is probably the most, but the second one for me is, it would be um, people shooting birds over young bird dogs, pointing dogs that were pointed. Yeah. Now there there's a there's a fine line here. Um, <laughs> if if my buddy is a hundred yards away and a bird gets up in front of him and my dog is fifty yards the other side of me, so he's a hundred and fifty yards from that guy, is that okay? Okay, the, the, here's, where, here's where the problem lies. Let's say that you're out there and you're working these quail in your yard and um, you're going to try to shoot a bird from your own pup and the dog run, smells the birds and runs into them. And flushes them, never pauses, never points, and you pull up and shoot a bird. In a lot of dogs, that becomes the proper sequence to the best outcome. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the, the bird's on the ground, I get to hold it or swallow it or bury it. And so they're associative yeah. learners, so yeah. they learn, they can learn that each time they bust a bird up, if, if you're going to shoot it, that they just bust them, they don't point. Mm -hmm. uh, we have several dogs that come into training that people do that with, and um, the first thing we have to do is change the habits of the owner to, yeah. you know how it is. I mean, you may go hunting somewhere, it's a bad day, and you walk four miles and finally get a shot. Mm -hmm. A lot of people take it, but with a young dog, yeah, you just kind of got to hold off. And uh, I tell people, don't, don't, don't load your gun until the dog is on, actually on point. Perfect. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah, my first one, I finally uh, came to the conclusion that I might actually own a German wire-haired flusher. <laughs> that's, that's what happens, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we worked through it, uh, but it, it was a long process. Um, mm -hmm. How about gear? I mean, your training and hunting gear vis-a-vis -vis our dogs. What are some of the things that you might have or take that we haven't thought about? Well, two, two must-haves that we 
won't leave home without is our tracker, number one. Yeah. That will save your dog's life. Um, and oftentimes people say, well, my dog doesn't run big enough to need a tracker. <laughs> We've had dogs caught in barbed wire fence. We've had dogs caught in snares. We've had dogs fall into wells. Um, and without that tracker, we would not have found them. And so that is your number one biggest piece of equipment to take with you. And, and of course, the e-collar. So we run our dogs with two collars on, a Garmin Pro 550 and a Astro 430 tracker. And so they wear both those collars each time in the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and then the other don't leave home without it is we have cable cutters. Yes. And they have to be the type of cable cutters that um, you can get from like a bicycle shop. Uh, a simple Leatherman will not do. They have to actually be cable cutters. And you have to have those if your dog gets caught in a snare because those snares are made to tighten down. And that's the only way to get in there and get them cut if your dog gets caught in a snare. Uh, amen to that. I've got a pair, uh, heard the same basic story and, uh, never would have trusted a leather man anyway, but, uh, mm-hmm. thank you for that. John, how about you? What, what do you see maybe in the training side that the, uh, the tool or the gadget that, uh, that can help us the most? Well, as far as Jessica said, the tracker, the other part is that, you know, whenever we go out hunting, um, I think that as a tra- the trainer itself is the, the biggest tool. You are the trainer. Yeah. When you go hunting, you're the trainer. And if you have a young dog you're developing, I'm going to just suggest that, again, take the shells out of the gun, have your, if you use your dog's collar trained and all those things properly, have that transmitter in your hand. Don't worry about shooting birds for a while and develop your dog properly because you, you're, you as a trainer is the most valuable thing that there is out there besides that dog. And if you don't take the time to do it at an early age – at those first few hunts or the first season or two, um, you're going to, you're going to pay for it for years. And, uh, I think that's probably the most valuable thing you can do is be the, be your dog's trainer, be your dog's advocate, making sure they're doing the right things and it'll pay the biggest dividends throughout its life. Yeah. I, I can't think of a better way to end our first of many conversations. Um, you are uh, so busy uh, yeah, and you're making time for all of us in the middle of a, a big, long set of field trials, uh, which I'm glad uh, you're doing well at so far. That's John and Jessica Han. Uh, with Perfection Kennels, I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast. John and Jessica uh, learned so much. I'm going to have a hard time digesting it all for a while, but um, mm-hmm. I sure appreciate your filling us all in. Thanks so much. I'll turn you loose to relax just a little bit. Thanks for being part of the Upland Nation podcast. Well, thank you for having us. We really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and we've got more to come, including some alternate ways for you to pick a destination for that big trip of the year or just your weekend trips for that matter. It's all coming up right here on the Upland Nation podcast where we are made possible by PointerShotguns.com. You know, the new guns, the side-by-sides have been very well received. Don't forget, you can always find a nearby dealer at PointerShotguns.com. While you're there, shop all the models, take a look at all the finishes from the case coloring to the Cerakote to all the other ways that you can enjoy a great gun, whether it's a starter gun for somebody new in the world of hunting or you're going to be um, upgrading your own situation. PointerShotguns.com is where you learn more about all of their great choices. And then keep them clean and functioning well with sageandbreaker.com. Gun cleaning and care, heirloom products of all sorts from the cleaning mat to the uh, tool carrying stuff and that new range bag soon to be back. So stand by for that. And now is the time to kind of go through all uh, in the TV business what we call consumables. All the liquids and gadgets that you're going to use up and throw away. Um, they've got plenty of that, including their new firearms grease and their CLP, which is a spray on clean lubricate and protect, uh, liquid. And, um, all of that will come to you, uh, via email. If you have signed up at sageandbreaker.com for their mailing list, I'll see you there. Some of my articles end up on Fred's pages, and I hope you enjoy those, and I know you will enjoy all the products from Sage 
and Breaker.com. I asked you a while back where you got suggestions and advice on where to go hunting if you're looking for a new spot, and um, you know, I was a little surprised. 35% of you said uh, your friends, uh, 22% said uh, you're reaching out to a state wildlife agency or their website, and then about 17% are looking at one of those online mapping apps just to to see what's out there. Uh, you know, maybe because I, uh, I, I w- I'm a journalist too, yeah, I can prove it, but um, I, I, I think there's one other way to do this that might be of value to you, and uh, it means that you'll have to go back onto your phone or your laptop to do it, but how about a Google search? I know, I know you're going to get a lot of weird stuff there from uh, misleading information to uh, chat rooms that are 14 years old and the data is all, you know, all over the place. But every once in a while, there's a gem in a Google search. And if uh, you search for the right terms, it might help, Uh, whether it's pheasant prospects in South Dakota or quail hunting in Arizona. Those kind of searches, uh, especially if you dig deep into the second and third and fourth pages of those Google searches, you never know what might turn up, especially, you know, for example, a local newspaper article. Wildlife agencies are always putting out news in, you know, one way or another. Some of that has a, you know, a nugget or two that might be of value to you. Uh, I even found a spot in somebody's obituary. I I know that, no, I'm not a ghoul. I'm not morbid in that regard, but every once in a while, number one, you want to, you read about people who had a great life and one of the things in their great life was their bird hunting. And sometimes they like to tell where they went and it's always worthwhile. The other thing I look for are guides and outfitters. Study their websites for general information on the the areas where they take their paying clients. You know, a lot of those pro guides are hunting on public land and they're hoping you'll never discover it. And I'm not suggesting you horn in on their spot, but if you can figure out through your own detective work and uh, and that sort of thing, uh, the general area, well, it's a start. Those kind of tips are also available at findbirdhuntingspots.com, which is where I put out all of this information, and including the new online webinar on, uh, well, everything having to do with finding public access. Tips like that, among other things. So I hope you'll take a look at that and maybe join us all there at the online webinar as well. Well, thank you, John and Jessica Han, for your help there. I appreciate all of your advice, your wisdom, and uh, glad to hear you're doing so well at that field trial. Uh, appreciate all of you who um, have commented at social platforms. If you left a rating or a review, thank you very much. appreciate all those. And I appreciate the support of all of our sponsors who make the time and resources available to allow us to do this. Sage and Breaker, Pointer Shotguns, Joy Dog Food, Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School, and True Lock Chokes. If you want more information on John and Jessica Hand, then just go to perfectionkennel.com. I sure learned a lot from them, and I'm sure you did too. Thanks so much, everybody, for listening. I'm Scott Linden. I'll see you down the road.